Hey, I'm Paul Cardall, and before we get into this podcast, I want you to know that this is absolutely one of my favorite guests I've ever had on this show. In fact, after you meet this gentleman, you'll know why I invited him to go to Wyoming with me, to be with some friends up in the mountains, where he taught us how to do some incredible things like building a sweat lodge, looking for food that you could actually eat if you need to survive. I mean, these are incredible adventures that we had. In fact, I made them part of my new TV show called All Heart Adventures. If you go to my website, paulcardall.com, you can watch those under the Adventures link. And my guest today, Jordan Bell, that you're about to learn about and hear his incredible, incredible story. We have a lot of fun, exciting, wild, and crazy entertaining, family-friendly TV shows you can watch that have a lot of inspiration as well at the end. So anyways, let's get into this. Uh, Please subscribe to my podcast, All Heart with Paul Cardall, and go to my website to watch the TV show, All Heart Adventures. All right, let's get into this podcast. Cause you took my scars Bruises and broken heart And numbed all the pain Show me how to heal And now I don't feel broken anymore Hi everybody, welcome to All Heart. I'm your host, Paul Carnall. I'm thrilled about today because I have a favorite TV show. My favorite TV show is called Alone. It's on the History Channel. And this is not just any other show. This is about survival. Something that I love trying to figure out how to survive regardless of our circumstances, our challenges. You just want to keep plugging away. You know, there are wilderness survival shows like Man vs. Wild and Survivor Man. This is one of those. The History Channel sends 10 to 12 contestants up into the wilderness in British Columbia where the grizzly bears are. Sometimes they go even further north. And these people are put on a five square mile radius. They can only take 10 items with them. And whoever taps out the last is the winner. They've out survived everybody else went up to half a million to a million dollars. So I'm watching season eight and I really began to connect with Jordan Bell because, you know, he's creating this cabin. He's building it with only the 10 items he has. He's got a door. He's catching fish. He's doing all these things I've only dreamed about doing as a heart transplant recipient. Well, then he starts talking about his daughter. His daughter was born with congenital heart disease like me. Hers, a little bit more complex. She needed several surgeries as a child. And this has been one of the biggest challenges of Jordan's and his wife's life. So we're gonna talk about his experience on alone. We're gonna talk about what it's like to have a child with congenital heart disease. So join us today here on All Heart with Paul Cardall. Without further ado, this is Jordan Bell. Thanks, Paul. Um, I appreciate it. I'm honored to be here, and you are an inspiration to many, many people. Well, I think uh, I think the feeling is absolutely mutual because when I watched, I've been watching alone uh, this show, and we'll talk about what that show is. But I've been watching it since the beginning because it's just always been an obsession of mine to go out into the to the forest, to the wilderness. You know, there are woods, forests, and wilderness. You went into the wilderness with 12 other contestants, anybody who's willing to go out into the middle of Northern Canada all by themselves on, I think it was like five square mile radius, surrounded by grizzly bears, build shelter. So anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself, but let's backtrack. You learned about the show. Uh, How long ago did you learn about the show? Uh, Back when I saw the previews for season one, I remember seeing the previews and thinking, you know, this is another crazy reality show and how realistic is it going to be? And logistically, how do you pull something like this off and how, 
you know, is it fake and is it dramatized and everything? But as I watched the show and as I became a fan and watched the subsequent seasons, you realize that this is a legitimate thing. And um, that's what makes it so compelling is because you get to see genuine experiences from genuine people actually doing this. This is not contrived. Nothing is made up. Um, and I think that's what people are craving in a show like this. The, the, the realism and the, hu you know, the, the humanity, the, the honest emotions that come out of people when they're put in a situation like this. Yeah. And it reminded me of a, and I, I can't remember the name, name of the, oh, Into the Wild. It reminded me of Into the Wild, a very popular story about a young man from back East. Uh, I think you're from Maine originally. Right? Originally. Yes. So there was a young man who was born into a lot of money um, and he just felt disassociated from his family and he wanted to venture into Alaska and it's this incredible story. Um, but it, it reminded me of that in the sense that you are literally all by yourself. I mean, you have uh, a few things when you go out into the middle of nowhere, what are the things that you're allowed to take with you? Because you have to make a decision. Yes. What you can take and what you can't take. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, you're allowed to bring 10 items aside from your clothing and, and um, um, well, I guess just your clothing. You know, those yeah. those things, you have a, a set list of clothing you're allowed to bring. And other than that, you have 10 items to pick from a list that you're allowed to bring. So that becomes a very, very difficult choice because it's easy to narrow it down to say 15 items. But when you bring it down to 10 items, they really came up with a magical number of, you have to leave some things behind that you really feel are essential, but you only get 10 items. Which is crazy because I just went on an adventure to Puerto Rico with a friend of mine who is a metal detector. He metal detects underwater and he took two massive suitcases and a backpack and I was like, is there anything else you need to bring? I mean, we pretty much have everything, but that was the equipment he needed, plus all of his clothes, everything. And yet 10 items, what are, what are the 10 items? Uh, I'm just curious what those 10 items are that you can take with you into the middle of nowhere to protect yourself from grizzly bears. I'm trying to think off the top of my head what my 10 items were, but of course I went with a sleeping bag because going into the cold weather, you're gonna need a sleeping bag. Um, you know, things like an ax, uh, a multi-tool, like a Leatherman, um, you know, some of, some of the basic tools, I'm, I'm a big tool guy, so I need my tools, but then you get into things like fishing line and, yeah. and hooks, and then you get into snare wire. And then for me, it comes down to snare wire or snare wire versus paracord, uh, I really can't have both. I don't have room on my list for both. And what am I going to use more? Um, so those are some of the things that become super difficult, but for me, it was really a, a tool heavy list because I, you know, I work with my hands for a living. I'm a carpenter, uh, by trade and I need my tools to be able to craft the world around me. Yeah. And during your episode, you used quite a bit of your experience as, as a builder to, you know, build shelter. Uh, you don't take a tent with you. You don't take uh, a, a foam with you for a nice padding. You don't take a heater with you. You don't take a Coleman stove. I mean, it's like the bare essentials. And that's what's mind blowing to me is you're using your knowledge of the land. Yeah. And one of the things that's different from typical um, survival scenario that maybe you train for you, you play around with, um, you know, I've been doing this my whole life, but, um, when you're practicing, when it's for fun, you build a survival shelter that you're going to spend one night in or two nights in. But when you get out there and your goal is to stay out there for literally months, you need to build something that is going to contain you for months and it's going to be you know, sufficient for that. But at the same time, you want to make sure you're not expending too many calories while you're building that. And that's one of those trade-offs that's so hard. You know, I, a lot of people said, boy, you, you wasted way too many calories building this elaborate shelter. But at the same time, you see people that skimp on that 
And then when they are hungry and, and deprived of calories and sleep and everything else, they're basically living under a tarp and that kind of drains you too. So it, it's a tough, there's, there's no perfect strategy that's going to work for everybody. It's one of those things where you just have to adapt it to yourself and what feels good for you. I thought it was fascinating how you, you know, you measure your, you, you guess how many calories you burned because that tells you how much you actually need. And most of the contestants, contestants can easily, well, within reason, access protein. But getting fat, which helps process the protein through your body, so you actually get all the nutrients, that seems to be one of the biggest challenges of the show. You can, you can kill an ox and have all that meat, but if you don't have fat with it, I mean, we've seen this scenario and people have had to go home. And, th and that's one of the things that we all knew going into this season because of our limited game. We knew that, you know, in my mind, fish was going to be huge because it's going to be one of the, the fattiest sources of protein out there. Uh, the only other option was a white tailed deer and deer's got great meat, but it doesn't have a lot of fat in it at all. That's yeah. lean meat, and you're going to continue to lose weight while you're eating that. You can eat your fill, and you're still going to lose weight. So, um, and especially with, you know, you're at the end of fall going into wintertime, so you've got limited berries for any kind of carbohydrates or anything like that. So it's very tough going into it, in this season especially, because we, we had a heavy amount of restrictions on what we could get. And we knew that the fishing was going to be different than the past couple of seasons, you know, on Great Slave Lake. And, and they're putting in gill nets and pulling out these giant fish. Yeah. And we knew this was going to be a totally different game. Yeah, because the previous season, I mean, they were just getting rabbit after rabbit, squirrel after squirrel. You guys, the food was scarce. You're, surround, you're in grizzly country. Um, it The whole process to me is just mind-blowing because I've watched, you know, Man vs. Wild or Survivor Man, and they, they've got a crew nearby. How far away was the crew, the rescue people, and, and they are rescue people because you call them when you're at your wit's end. Uh, uh, every contestant, when they're ready to tap out, they've exhausted all options or they've got a medical emergency. How far away is the crew? Uh, they're at least an hour to an hour and a half boat ride out. Um, and they try to run contingency. So they have pre-planned um, basically forward base where if really bad weather's coming in, they'll actually send a crew out that's going to be closer to some of the contestants okay. because, you know, it can be life or death if we're in a, in a terrible storm and something happens it's it's no joke you're out there alone there is nobody out there so i think it was probably about an hour and a half hour and an hour and a half depending on where we were um on the lake for them to get there and that's as fast as they could you know if, if the weather's bad uh chilco lake gets huge waves on it it could be even longer than that but an hour to an hour and a half minimum for them to get there and when you decided to go nude and get get right in that lake you, you went full monty <laughs> and you went right into that they blurted out folks <laughs> and and then he walks back out of this lake and he's like you didn't have to blur it but they and they actually showed it <laughs> um, it was it was interesting how cold how cold was it when you went in frigid Oh my gosh. It was absolutely frigid. You know, um, that day just happened to be very warm. It felt great out, but that lake is 1200 feet deep. It is super cold water year round. Um, it was very, very cold, but at the same time, you got to bathe once you've been in there. I think that was maybe day nine or something. And, you know, you got to do some laundry, you got to bathe and, and, you got to really pick those moments because even when it looked beautiful and it was sunny and warm, those moments would last for literally 20 or 30 minutes and a storm would roll over the mountains that you didn't even see coming. Yeah. Let's go back. Uh, you know, we'll come back to the show, but I want to go back into your, your upbringing in Maine. Um, I, I, I noticed on your uh, bio, some things you did and it's fascinating because my father was a journalist, a TV journalist, and he would create these little uh, segments 
for the local TV station about unique people doing amazing things. And one of the things were beaver trappers. So as a kid, he took me and my brothers, there were three of us, he took us beaver to, to he took us to meet beaver trappers up in the Uintas uh, in Utah, which are beautiful mountains. And there, uh, the families had teepees and they trapped beaver. This is something you did growing up. And I've told people beaver meat is actually pretty good. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's a rich meat, you know, beaver have a lot of fat in them. Of course they need to be, uh, you know, need that fat to, um, survive in the, in the cold weather. But yeah, I grew up, uh, doing that. And it was actually something that I learned alongside my father. Um, we had a camp in Northern Maine and we met an old French Canadian trapper and he taught my father how to trap beaver. And I was right there alongside with him. So, um, you know, I grew up doing that kind of stuff and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a unique learning experience. There's not a lot of people that ever get to do that. No. And we, you know, growing up in Utah, we would call them frontier men and that they still exist. They would still have their, uh, I don't know if you call it a conference or a revival, but uh, the mountain men would all get together and they would trap through this, through the summer. And, uh, it, my shop teacher at the junior high was, a, uh, one of the trappers. And so, but you grew up doing this. So obviously you learn the skills as early as a young boy to help prepare you for some of this, what are some other things that your family did or that you learned to do that helped prepare you for, for this? Um, you know, we just grew up hunting and, and just being out in the woods and, and fishing and everything. We spent a lot of time, um, outdoors as a family and it was very independent minded. You know, our family were, you know, we're all a little bit of loners. And so we, kind of just be isolated out there in the woods and doing stuff. And, you know, I remember as a kid getting a book on bushcraft and I really fell in love with learning how to make traps, learning how to make primitive shelters. And I remember as a kid going out there, just practicing this stuff and, and wanting to go out there and, and sleep in the woods for no reason other than just to do it and try it. And, you know, I would uh, have the wit scared out of me, but I'd still want to get up and do it again. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you is about fear, uh, being alone in the wilderness. You're not alone. That's the point. You're not alone. You are surrounded. And when you walk around, uh, for those that have never been camping in, uh, you know, the mountains away from people, you literally feel like you have eyes on you. And you do. And you do, um, you know, in Maine, in Northern Maine, um, when I was a kid, there were large, large packs of coyotes that were always out there. And, um, you know, I remember, uh, shining a flashlight out and seeing dozens of eyeballs reflecting back at me. And there's a pack of coyotes out there. And, um, you know, you, you, coyotes aren't that big, but when there's 20 of them, you know, you don't stand a chance against that, especially when you're 12 years old. Oh yeah. Yeah. Were you, uh, were you big into to BB guns and having the BB gun around and oh, yeah. like that? Or were you, yeah. yeah. And what, do you feel like you're better at setting a snare to trap the animal, uh, or using a weapon? Um, fairly capable either way. Um, my weak point would probably be archery. You know, I, I, um, had an old bear, uh, bow when I was a kid and then I didn't touch archery again until, uh, really until about two years ago when, uh, mm -hmm. I thought about going on the show and I was like, well, I better learn how to shoot a bow again if I have dreams of going on this show. And I wonder why, why do they use the bow? Why don't they give you a gun or a a crossbow or a compound bow is it why is the traditional and i can't remember the name of it but why the traditional bow um i think it's the primitive nature of it and i think that's um part of what people are looking for in this you know they want to see it as raw as possible and so having like a traditional recurve bow is something that's raw it's not um, aided by very much technology. I mean, everything that we're doing is, you know, old, old technology um, for the most part, aside from, you know, some modern clothing and everything. But part of that is to 
you know, limit the danger of people actually dying on the show. Yeah. It's uh, so, so you know, let's back to the show for a minute. This is the season where they decided to put the contestants in grizzly country. So instead of being the hunters, they were being, they're the hunted is the way they build it. Right. <laughs> Alone is back. You're not at the top of the food chain here. On Grizzly Mountain, it's more dangerous than ever. Every second we're on the land, we're being hunted. Alone, only on the History Channel. And I don't know how many of the contestants had ever encountered a grizzly bear before, but had you had any experience besides a zoo uh, encountering or seeing a grizzly out in the wilderness? Yeah, so I lived in Alaska for nine years and I was in grizzly territory um, quite often. Now, most of the time that I was in you know, grizzly territory, I had a firearm with me or um, you know, there were times that I'd do some backpacking or, or just some long treks and stuff, but um, you kind of minimize your exposure, you know um, you know, a lot of times I was on those treks, I was in open terrain, you keep yourself in open terrain. So you feel fairly comfortable in those situations. Now, the contrast with going on the show is you're cooking food, or hopefully you have some some kind of food, you know, I got that one bull trout. So you're cooking food in this area. And you know, you do it as far away from your shelter as possible. But you're exposed in this environment, but also like where my location was, it was very, very dense area. Mm -hmm. And so when I had to leave my area, I literally had to walk on bear paths to get along the side of the river. And I had the, or the side of the lake and I had a river coming down. So I had all this noise. I could not hear anything. And that is disconcerting because I know that if I startle a bear, no matter how careful I am, if yeah. I startle a bear, there's a good chance that I could get attacked. Um, and that danger is very real. Um, there's just another uh, article came out with a guy that was held basically hostage in a camp uh, for a week in Alaska by a grizzly bear that had attacked him and, and he couldn't leave. And, wow. and, and that stuff happens. Yeah. It's, I've only seen... Uh, you know, bears out in the in the Smoky Mountains. They got into the garbage of the cabin, and uh, my wife is such a healthy eater. The bear didn't even find anything of interest. <laughs> you know, she it's like Zevia, stevia cans or Zevia cans, and she's like, "This is horrible." Or like Waterloo, they're like, "They don't want that stuff." So, <laughs> so, so that's one way to keep the bears away: is eat healthy, healthy. What are you doing? That's our garbage. <laughs> hey. Hey, that's our garbage. That, that's our garbage. <laughs> now, one thing you had mentioned to me in a previous conversation is that you guys weren't just out there for that limit because of COVID you had to quarantine to prepare for the show. So you were actually away from your family for much longer. Yes. So we had to, um, you know, we had to have special permission to get into Canada, um, have an exception. We had to go immediately into quarantine um, after going there. So we were in quarantine for two weeks and then we had our orientation before, um, you know, going out there. So I tapped on day 19, but that was actually 46 days I had been away from my family at that point. And that's something that the audience at home doesn't get to see or doesn't realize. And it's not like I had a cell phone access during that time either. When we were in quarantine and when we were in orientation, we didn't have cell service. Um, we did have some limited internet access, but it was not not even good enough to have a, a call really it was basically send a message once in a while and um you know so not being able to talk to my son or my wife for 46 days is you know that that's a long time it's longer than yeah. it looks like um from home when you see the show yeah, the families make a tremendous sacrifice in order to support you uh out there and um i think I, if i recall this season it was uh, the 
the winner gets half a million dollars. Mm -hmm. But I'm assuming that's not part of the motivation. I mean, that's there. That's nice. But I, but I would imagine most of the people that are doing this, they're just excited for the opportunity to experience something that's going to be life changing. Yes. And, and I think it's very personal to most people. It's a personal growth journey. Um, and that's why I think everyone, like we all call ourselves participants more than contestants because, um, you know, it would be different if there was a second place prize or a third place, but there's only one winner and everyone else, you know, that there's only a one in 10 chance you're going to make it. The rest of you, uh, you know, you're going out there and you're disrupting your life just to go out there. So you have to be in it for more than just the money. Yeah. Well, obviously you love the outdoors. There's something spiritual that takes place and, you know, watching you, uh, was so inspiring to me. Um, for me, I had some pretty bad days once I got through that busy time of banking my shelter and everything as far as missing my family, grieving for my daughter, the loss of my daughter, that kind of stuff. Um, but it was a combined thing. It wasn't any one thing that made me decide that I needed to leave. Um, there were things like, you know, I had my one fish, but you know, when you're out there fishing for four to six hours a day and you're not getting any fish and you had that one fish in all that time, when you don't see any large game. And one thing they didn't show is, um, my bowstring actually got chewed through, um, Matt, just like Matt's did. And Matt got shown on television. Mine didn't, it wasn't quite as dramatic of a scene. But that happened on day six, and so I'm trying to figure out how do I pull this together, but also am I going to waste time trying to retest this bow with a shortened bowstring when I don't see any sign of deer, and and what am I going to hunt with, with this because I don't see anything. So what I kept coming to the conclusion is, is, is I didn't see a path to victory on it. And the hard part for me is because I'm such a competitive person. I wanted to be drug off the show. I wanted yeah. to go until I couldn't go any longer, regardless of my chances of winning. But the hard part is, is as a husband and as a father, I kept thinking, is it selfish of me to continue to do this and stay away from my family and um, not provide, you know, I had to shut down my business. I'm self-employed contractor. I had to shut down my business. The longer you're shut down in business, the harder it is to jump back in when you get, you know, back. And so I kept thinking all these things, like if I come back completely emaciated and I'm, I'm mentally drained, I'm physically yeah. drained. Yeah. Well, I, as soon as I get back from the woods, I have to throw tool bags on. I have to get back to work. So it becomes this thing where you start feeling selfish where I like, I really should be back home. If I can't win, if I can't win the money, then it's just a point of pride. And when do I just throw my pride out the window and my duty as a husband and father step in. And that's a very difficult thing to deal with when you have no one to sound this off from. You're just going through this in your own head and you have no one to talk to yeah. about it. Yeah the psychological game in all of it. And, you know, they say that being alone helps you process trauma from the past while at the same time experience new trauma mm -hmm. because you don't have that. I thought it was, there was so much grace in the way you, you went home because you, you almost hesitated, but then you shared the story of your daughter. And that's what drew me in. Um, I, I was connecting already with your story, but then when you mentioned your daughter was born with a congenital heart de uh, defect, which I, you know, I, which I was born with, I just felt such a need to want to tell the world about her. And, uh, you know, what a, what a gift you've been given to be her dad for, for that time. Do you mind telling us a little bit more about your little girl and her name and and, yeah, uh, what she was born with, and absolutely. So, um, my daughter Aura was born with Tetralogy of Fallot. 
And that's a pretty rare congenital heart defect. I think there's less than 20,000 cases a year. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's incredibly difficult when, you know, with her, we didn't know ahead of time. Nobody knew. And I'm, and I'm actually glad that we didn't know because there was nothing that anybody could do, um, you know, in utero, there's nothing that could have been done to help it. All it would have done is add stress, but you know, it's our second child. Our daughter is born. She looks healthy. Everything is great. They take her back to do a few tests and then they don't come back with her for a long time. And we're saying, Hey, what's going on? Well, her oxygen's just a little low, but she was not cyanotic. You know, she was not blue or anything like that. Everything looked fine. And so it's like, Hey, bring, bring us our daughter. What, what are you doing? And are we going to run a few more tests? And, you know, then they had to, uh, you know, do an echocardiogram and then come down and sit down and talk to us and say, Hey, she's got this tetralogy of flow. And you're like, you know, what's this? She looks perfectly healthy. Everything's great. What are you talking about? So within a few hours time of welcoming your daughter into this world, all of a sudden you find out she has this congenital heart defect and they say, we have to, uh, rush her to Vanderbilt right away. And they said, go home, pack some suitcases and go to Vanderbilt. Cause you're going to be there for a while. Um, and that's really, really hard to take. That's especially when she's born looking so perfect and, and nothing obvious uh, looks wrong. So you have to instantly become an expert in this. You know, you just study everything you can, try and figure out everything you can about what this is and what's the prognosis and what do we do from here? Um, and that's one of the hardest parts is the ups and downs that go along with it because there is no perfect plan. There is no, um, you know, we, we thought that at first, the cardiologist at Vanderbilt's like, oh, here's what we got to do and this surgery and this surgery and then this happens. And that's the clean cut version. Um, probably they told us to try and keep from overwhelming us, but um, you don't realize the struggle that goes with it or the variability of the prognosis. Um, so when she was two weeks old, um, she underwent open heart surgery and um, um, her, uh, um, the, the artresia, they thought at first it was stenosis, then artresia completely blocked up flow. They did a surgery, open heart surgery, mm -hmm. and it didn't succeed. Something clogged up again. So less than 24 hours later, back in again, another open heart surgery. Um, so then we go home and, and, you know, have our little girl that's, you know, gone through an open heart surgery at two weeks old and then had to bring her back at six months old for what they call a unifocalization procedure. The amazing part of the human body and our creation is that her body, knowing that, you know, the, the blood flow wasn't properly circulating to the lungs and everything, starts growing these new arteries that bypass everything. And that's the only reason why she came up healthy looking and breathing and having 90 something percent oxygen and everything else is the body's a, a miracle. It's, yeah. it's found a way to bypass all this. Well, now we're trying to correct all that. So the unifocalization is they have to try and trace all these arteries and reroute yeah. them. So she was in surgery for 10 hours, um, at six months old. And, um, you know, it's, it's not without significant risk. So you sit there, for 10 hours, um, just trying to hope for the best and, but knowing that something terrible could happen. And at the same time, I've got a three-year-old son that we're trying to take care of and, and right. maintain normalcy for. Right. Man. And this is something that thousands of parents are experiencing throughout the world. And, uh, it's, ironic with congenital heart disease because it's the least funded and yeah. the least research because you can't see it on a child um unless they take their shirt off you see the the side effects or the which is you know you have a scar and that's symbolic that you, you know you've had some trauma and you've made it through um 
Yeah, what a beautiful name for your daughter. And uh, what a beautiful experience. And uh, uh, just, uh, yeah, just, it's devastating. It's absolutely devastating. She, did she make it through that procedure? Yes, so she made it through that procedure. And, um, you know, they told us that basically every six months we'd have to go back to Vanderbilt and they would have to do catheter procedures to try and open up her arteries, to balloon them and open them up. So from that point on, every six months we would go back um, to have her arteries uh, ballooned and, and enlarged to increase the blood flow. And throughout the whole time, it became very difficult, you know, early on, it was our understanding that she would have this procedure, she would have that procedure, yeah. good prognosis. And then I remember at one point, um, one of the cardiologists saying that, um, you know, she'll has a pretty good chance of making it to adulthood, but not so sure after that. And it's kind of like, wait, wait, time out. Nobody, what do you mean? No one ever really explained that. So at that point, I was thinking long, healthy life, complications, but you know, you, you fight through it. And then all of a sudden they tell you that there's an expiration date. Um, like you talked yeah. about, like, Hey, there's, and I try to be the eternal optimist. So, um, I would always say, Hey, you know what? Technology is always improving. Things are always evolving, um, with different procedures. So you know what, in the next 20 years, things will, uh, you know, things will improve. They'll find a way to fix this. It'll be okay. And then when she was, uh, a uh, couple months shy of four years old, um, she collapsed. She hadn't been feeling well for a few days, but she basically collapsed out of nowhere and um, we lost her. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, and I can't even imagine what that must have been like. And uh, you shared that. You shared that on the show and it was such a display of strength. Uh, strength to me is humility under control because you held that pain within you and you expressed how beautiful it was to be her father. What a gift it was to be a father and, and what an honor to know her. Um, and we'll continue to pray for you guys. What do you hope people and the medical community can learn or do uh, better having gone through that experience, what's your hope? Um, well, like you said, congenital heart defect is the least funded, the least seen, least acknowledged. It's one of those things that never on my radar um, as, a, um, as a father and as an expecting father, um, you just don't think about that. Um, and there are very few, um, there are very few people that specialize and can handle that. And luckily, you know, being uh, outside of the Knoxville area, it's just a few hours to Nashville and to get to Vanderbilt. And there's only a few hospitals in the country that really are capable of handling um, patients with tetralogy of flow. It's such a specialized thing. But congenital heart defects in general, um, I certainly do wish that there was more awareness, more funding, because the overall spectrum of congenital heart defects, there's, there's a lot of them out there and, um, it doesn't get the funding. It doesn't get the attention. It doesn't get the, the, the walks and the fundraisers and the kinds of things that, you know, other, um, illnesses or, or any, you know, birth defects or anything like that get, it doesn't get that kind of attention. And, and it's very hard. It becomes like this underground world when you, um, when you're a parent of a child with a congenital heart defect, all of a sudden you're, you're like, what's this underground world of these parents of heart yeah. babies? Yeah. And you didn't realize it existed before, you know, you know, about, um, you know, cancer patients and, and, uh, you know, different, you know, different things and illnesses and things that the medical community combats, but you don't really ever think about heart defects like that or, or, you know, how many people have a 
relatively mild, you know, uh, yeah. the, uh, ventricular septal defect or, you know, anything like that. But, but it's more common as far as heart defects in general go than people realize. And, and like you said, it just doesn't get that kind of funding, the research and the attention. So the few doctors that are capable of handling that um, are a godsend. There are some incredible people that can do that. And um, I don't care how much they get paid, they don't get paid enough. When, when you have the responsibility of a child's life in your hand to do that. I can't even imagine uh, the stress of being responsible for operating on children like that and knowing that if something doesn't turn out right, whether it's your fault or not, you still have to face the parents. Um, that's an extremely difficult thing. That's a whole other world that I didn't even realize existed until I became her dad. Yeah, yeah, it is definitely a unique scenario and even though there's millions there's only a handful of organizations that have come together to really try to uh, seed uh, federal funding so that they can do research there's an organization called saving tiny hearts which started because two parents they had a kid with a complex heart disease mended hearts is one mm -hmm. um, uh, it's my heart, I think, and then there's uh, there's Intermountain Healing Hearts, and there's a lot of support groups. But as far as actually seeding research and uh, funding, um, we need more of that. Uh, the American Heart Association will put the face of children on a lot of things, and you know they have a different responsibility in teaching heart health. But when it comes to the uh, advancements in anatomy and correcting anatomy and fixing that we do have a lot of work so i am grateful um ironically for you and and what you went through i, I wish you didn't have to go through that at all um but thank you for your willingness to speak out and talk about it because i know that must be excruciating i saw it on your face in the film um and even now it's it's not easy to talk to but the more we talk about these things, then the more people are aware of, of these situations and, and we don't want other parents to, you know, to go through this same refiner's fire. Right. You experienced. And it's, it's, uh, it's a hard thing because, um, you know, the, the people that do run these organizations and participate, you know, I know Mended Hearts was very active in Vanderbilt and uh, came around and, and very supportive. Um, but at the same time, it's so hard when your child is, you know, if your child is still alive and, and living with this congenital heart defect, you don't want it to define your life at the same time. You know, you want to go about life as normal and you want that child to have a normal life and you don't want to take on that identity as I'm a CHD parent or, or whatever. I'm a heart baby parent. Um, or, you know, even after, you know, the loss of our daughter. Um, it's hard because you have, you still have life to go on and I still have, uh, you know, another child that I have to take care of. And it's so hard to, again, you don't want to be identified by that and let that kind of rule your, your life. So the people that go out there and do that kind of stuff, um, they're incredible for doing it. They're incredible for taking on the weight of that and carrying forward with it. And I'm extremely grateful for the people that do do that. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Well, so you're back home, you're uh, back to construction, you're out of the mountains, out of the wilderness. Um, do you have plans to get out with maybe some of the contestants and go out just for fun and explore and do some things together with them and create more memories? I actually just came back from Wyoming the other day. I was in Wyoming with Tim and Biko um, at Tim's cabin and we were out fishing for a week and uh, you know just living it up in the woods and I plan on going back in September for a bear hunt out there so yeah. definitely you make you make lifelong friends when you share an experience like that with them. No I yeah thank you for being part of All Heart, and uh, you are a man who is All Heart, and I appreciate you sharing your legacy, everything you're doing, uh, your daughter, <clears throat> and tell your wife thank you.
for for taking the time to be with us and appreciate you so much Jordan absolutely if I could I do want to say um, one other thing in related to um, you know my daughter's experience and everything yeah. um, one of the the greatest blessings we had when we were dealing with this is the Ronald McDonald house um, right there near Vanderbilt and you know they they have locations um, in uh, near hospitals around uh, the country and without them and their support um, I don't know what we would have done you know we were we were at Vanderbilt for a month the first time after she was born when she was uh, six months old again we were there for a month and they provide us with a place to stay uh, they provide us with with meals and um, you know, there's volunteer groups that brought in food and, and stuff every day um, and not having to worry about, you know, I, I couldn't afford a hotel for a month there both times and, and be at or off work at the same time, you know, I'm self-employed. Um, I couldn't have done it without them. So organizations like that, um, you know, are a godsend. Um, they are. So they are. I... You know, I, I've always seen the Ronald McDonald change things and you go into McDonald's and you don't really think anything of it until you're put in that position and you're like, this is what it's for. Like it eliminated one of the one of the stresses. It allowed me to focus on my daughter. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. It's another amazing organization that helps, um, you know, people in, in so many ways. Yeah, the McDonald's people, it's incredible. We tend to think of McDonald's as this fast food restaurant, but what they're actually doing is providing homes, places to stay for families like yours when their children are in the hospitals because it's such a financial burden and uh, it's so stressful. But when you have an organization like that that takes you in and is is so helpful. So I'm, <laughs> it's beautiful. Thank you for reminding me and, and everybody about the Ronald McDonald House. They are an incredible group of people. and. I know many of my listeners have had these experiences and, and have had family members with congenital heart disease and um, have stayed in those. So, so thank you so much. Cause you took my scars, bruises and broke.